Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to Exa Bootcamp's today open lecture slash workshop about a very exciting topic today. Um, and uh, thank you so much for Holonautic, of course, for joining in and for Unity bringing Brian. Thank you, Brian, for being with us today and for answering all these um, questions about dots that will come up. Yeah, I mean, agenda pretty clear. I mean, about us, about Exa Bootcamp, I think um, you've probably heard about our open lectures before. We are always um, bringing great speakers like today to talk about new topics, upcoming topics that may be interesting for you as XR via AR developer. And in the end, and that's very useful for everyone here, I think that you can ask your questions you have about the topics being discussed. Please make use of it. Um, use the Q&A tool uh, that you have here in Zoom and submit your, your questions as soon as possible so that we can have a chance to, to prepare the answers. Uh, yeah, about us, about Exa Bootcamp. So um, what is special about this is that we have a very, very great community and thank you all for showing up today. I think uh, right now I'm seeing over 200 people um, in, in, the, in the Zoom, so that's awesome. So feel free to also connect in our Discord server, in our Discord server, maybe someone can post the link to that and also um, yeah, exchange and um, share your knowledge with each other so that we can all advance the industry together. And yeah, our courses, our masterclass, classes are all very project focused, very technical focused, so that you can directly use them on the job. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of industry level advice to actually create our curriculum so it really makes sense um, what you're learning. Um, so yeah, our alumni are always very happy and we have some of them also here um, attending today. Uh, so even if you've already uh, learned a lot of Unity before and are working on it on an everyday basis, I think you can still learn new things in our master classes and will be uh, very happy with the results. And um, yeah, feel free to also check our YouTube channel for, for more reviews. And uh, yeah, we have um, all these companies which are visiting our classes um, every time. And uh, yeah, so, so it's also a good, um, good opportunity for you to network with, with more um, people in the XR industry. And yeah, Ferhan, do you want to maybe say a few words about our upcoming courses? Yes, thank you, Rahel. Uh, yeah, every time we, we are organizing these open lectures uh, and it is, great to see more and more people joining in such even sophisticated and maybe even uh, uh, quite specific uh, classes. So we see that there is a, a interest and we would like to continue and commit on uh, bringing this knowledge uh, uh, to you as much as we can, of course. So yeah, as uh, Rahel mentioned, we have uh, various classes. We are, we are known for uh, advanced and intermediate uh, Unity-based classes, but we also have beginner classes coming up uh, this summer. And uh, for more details, you can always visit xrbootcamp.com. I don't want to uh, take so much of your time, but regarding the advanced classes, maybe it might be interesting uh, to, to, to tell you what is our approach this year and next year. We believe that the standalone devices, VR, AR devices are uh, becoming more and more um, important for VR, AR industry. So we have created actually three main pillars in the next slide uh, I, can, um, I can share with you. So first one is the lifelike interactions. The second one is performance software architecture, which is actually, uh, we will talk a lot today. Uh, third one is a uh, smoothly running high quality experience um, in a performing way. So for these three main pillars that we have uh, defined as a, as a goal to upskill the industry, we have uh, designated actually different classes for that. Uh, most of these classes are for people who already uh, work on Unity and VR AR development. So the first class is um, advanced VR interactions class, which we, we also call it viral because there's a, a project there. We are teaching actually reactive programming there, which uh, we have, uh, we are really proud to have um, a very great diverse lineup uh, of cohort from uh, like this cohort is quite interesting from companies like uh, Autodesk, HP, um, Deloitte and um, lots of also universities like Harvard, Carnegie Mellon uh, joining this cohort. So we are quite happy to 
to really see them in one place and the discussions are really wonderful. We just finished one of the live sessions today. Um, and maybe in the next slide, I can also show uh, what, what we are doing in the, um, in the viral uh, project. So it is like basically a virtual robotic arm controlled by, by uh, hands, hand uh, gestures. Um, maybe Rahel, you can also uh, go to the next slide so we can uh, show. Yes, hand gestures, grab objects, and immerse kinematics and physics-based interactions. So at the end of this eight weeks advanced field interactions program, you are creating this um, uh, fully physics-based um, virtual robotic arm. Uh, let's go back and talk about a little bit of the rendering optimization class, which is actually starting this week. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is quite interesting because uh, what we are doing here is uh, we are teaching rendering optimization for standalone uh, XR devices. And uh, at the end of like this is a six weeks program. At the end of this uh, program, the last two weeks is a nightmare scenario that we are giving you a, a high quality, good looking scene running on uh, on a standalone device, but uh, with five frames per second. So we expect you to, to uh, bring it to 72 frames per second based on the techniques that you learn. So uh, yeah, this class is uh, starting actually officially tomorrow. So uh, anyone who is interested, I mean, we are almost full of that class as well. But if anyone interested for last minute, we are happy to open maybe one or two slots. So today we will talk about dots. Uh, we have, as you probably see, we have also some plans to, to really upskill the industry on dots. But uh, first, today, we, we would like to open up the, the um, much more on the informing part. What is the current stage of dots? How you can benefit it for your current or future projects? What are your challenges? So we would like to actually uh, thank to Unity team supporting us because they are the ones who know the current state of dots more than anyone else. So um, I know that there are several questions coming up. Maybe we can answer uh, most of them, but in case that we cannot answer uh, all of these questions, uh, we will make sure that these questions are being uh, stored in our Discord server and uh, in our database. We would like to create actually a few more dots related uh, workshops um, in the following months, based on, of course, interest. So uh, I'd like to thank Brian and Fabrice for joining us today. So uh, Brian, um, maybe uh, you can hand over from here uh, with your slides and you can um, also share a little bit about yourself and about, uh, about DOTS current, st sure. current stage. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian, and uh, I'm here with Fabrice, and we're both from the DOTS education team. And I'm going to walk through some slides, just explaining an, a, an overview of what DOTS is about. Um, and at the end, we'll have Q&A. Uh, we're going to focus really mostly on the parts of DOTS that are already production ready. That's collections, jobs, burst, and mathematics. And then entities and the packages related to entities, we, we'll say a little bit at the end about them. Um, but definitely don't want to speak for the company in terms of like making announcements. So uh, I can just say that um, if you have specific questions, go ahead and ask, but understand particularly when it comes to like talking about timelines of when things come out of preview, I, I definitely can't even hint at that. Um, but, but we can maybe say a little bit about where things stand and what things maybe need to improve, like what is what has been worked on, we can we can talk about some things that have already been talked about on the forums to some extent already. So, um, so let me get into my slides. Oh, I need to share my screen. Excuse me. Um, I guess I'll say a little bit about myself. So I, I joined Unity a year ago. Um, before that, uh, my background is in, is in web development, really. And that's most of my programming career. And then I made the jump over into games. I, I, I do have a couple of years experience teaching in, in coding boot camps. Uh, and, and then I started picking up Unity and that eventually led to this. So you two. Uh, I successfully made the jump from web development to games. So um, what is DOTS? That's primarily what it's about. So concretely, DOTS, it's a set of packages. And that's the best way to think of it. You shouldn't necessarily think of it all as a unified whole. Um, you can, in some cases, take some packages and use those and not use others. In particular, you can use these first four packages, the collections, jobs, burst, and mathematics. You can very effectively use them together in the context of a game that you're otherwise is not using entities. You can just take a, a conventional Unity game using game objects 
and model behaviors and find opportunities as Roger will demonstrate concretely to, to utilize these packages and, and often solve some, some uh, important performance problems you might have. So these, these five packages of dots, they define what I would call the, the core programming model, a, a way of writing code that leads to much more efficient CPU uh, code. Um, and then we have other packages and dots, uh, primarily these other five that are about implementing standard gameplay functionality, things you need from a game engine like rendering, physics, animation, audio, and netcode. These are implemented in terms of entities and the other uh, packages, the, the other core packages. So, so that is the basic division there. And, and like with entities, because these depend upon entities, they also are, are not yet out of preview. But we'll, we'll say a little bit about them at the end. So first question is, why is your CPU code slow? Like, what is it that slows down code? And actually, let me apologize. I, I have a habit of sometimes of talking too quickly. So someone kick me if I, I'm going way too fast. I know there are probably a lot of non-native English speakers in the audience. So I'll slow down. Um, so a major source of CPU inefficiency is, can often be garbage collection. Um, garbage collection is going to effectively randomly pause your game. And just at random times, it wants to run and do its business, scan through a bunch of memory, looking for your garbage. And when it does that, your code has to pause for some amount of time. And so that can lead to um, little jitters. In, in better cases, at worst, it can lead to like outright pauses that are very noticeable to users. So that's generally not really acceptable in games, right? It's particularly action games. Um, there are ways to mitigate the problem. That's what Unity developers currently do and have done for a long time. You can mitigate the problem, but it, you really want to get rid of it entirely, ideally. Uh, another big problem is that in classic Unity, most code actually by default, it's all on, on one thread. It's all running on the main thread. And that's leaving a lot of CPU cores to waste. Um, typical Unity game, written in mod behaviors, all that's running on the main thread and, and maybe you're not utilizing the other cores at all. Unity itself in some of its systems will, will do to some extent rendering and audio will utilize other cores in some ways, but your own code is all sitting on the main thread. And that's an obvious problem. And, and then the code running on those individual cores, the, the machine code generated by the compiler, uh, it's generally not all that great. Standard C-sharp compilers, standard compilers for all languages don't typically generate the best code. So that's a major problem. Uh, and then these last two bullet points uh, concerning cache friendliness, that relates to entities, so I'll save that for the, the second part of my talk after, after Roger speaks. So the collections package, what is it about? So it just simply provides you with standard data structures, lists, hash maps, queues, et cetera, basic you know, classic uh, computer science 101 data structures, but they are unmanaged. Um, the, the native list and native hash map that you create, they are unmanaged, meaning in C-sharp terms, they are not known to the garbage collector. Managed objects are things which the garbage collector knows about and is aware of and is responsible for uh, disposing when you no longer need. But with unmanaged objects, when you create them, you yourself are responsible for eventually deallocating them. You have to, when you create a native list, at some point you're expected to call the dispose method to deallocate it. Otherwise, you know, if you fail to do that, you can end up with a, a memory leak uh, of some degree. And having to manually manage memory in this way, being responsible for deallocation can be kind of scary uh, programmers of all of all kinds, not just in games, have been used to garbage collection for a long, long time. So it's scary to think that now suddenly you might introduce a bunch of memory leaks in your in your code. Uh, for a number of, of reasons, dots I think makes this not really a big concern at all. Um, and one of those major reasons that this turns out not to be a big deal in dots is because we have what we call safety checks. When you run your code in the editor um, and you enter play mode. By default, at least, safety checks are enabled. And one thing those safety checks will do is they can monitor your, um, your, your collections that you've allocated and look for ones that you haven't allocated in time. When, when, you, when you allocate a, a native list, for example, you, you specify how long you want it to live. And if it lives too long, you, you'll get an error. You'll get an exception on the console. So that typically will tell you exactly where, when you have these problems and they're not going to hide in your code. And you can, in most cases, very, very simply solve the problem. So that is a really important part of dots is these, these errors. Um, so by using unmanaged objects, we're going to be avoiding garbage collection and that's great. But also uh, very importantly, we want to deal with unmanaged data because the, the next two parts, the, the job system and burst, they can only work with unmanaged objects. They can't touch managed data at all. So that's another key reason that we need collections here. So the job system, what is this about? The idea of the job system is that we want to be able to write multi-threaded code, but we don't want to have to yourself um, do it in the conventional way of spawning threads yourself, managing those threads, 
farming work out to the threads and then having to synchronize data with, with locks and so forth. You don't want to have to do all that because it's infamously difficult to get right. It's difficult to make that code correct at all and not have race conditions and, and not have bugs, behavior bugs. But then also, even if you get all that correct, you can often end up with not really getting the full power of, of all those cores because all those locks can lead to a lot of contention and threads blocking other threads. So it's, it's hard to get the performance story right when you do it all manually yourself. So the idea of the job system is it want, it's a way of, of writing multi-thread code that is, is far simpler and less error prone and is much more likely to deliver um, efficient use of those cores. So the, the idea of a job is that it's a self-contained unit of work and that it is this thing that has its own private data. It just does some kind of in-memory computation on that data. Uh, and then when it's done, it produces you know, that, that, that data, then some of that can be consumed as, as a sense of, in a sense as output of the job. Um, you're not allowed to do IO in jobs. You can't like read and write files or access um, network uh, connections. You can only just work with this in-memory data. So they're self-contained with a caveat that, well, you need to get data out. And so you provide to a job, you provide at least one collection so that when you do some computation, you can then store the results in that collection. And then when the job is done, you can read the data in that collection. And that is, this, is how you get data out of a job basically. So, <clears throat> Concretely, what you do, as, as Roger will, will show, is you just define a job type, which is a struct. You implement this interface called iJob or one of its variants. And you just have the actual code of the job is this execute method. That is what will actually run when the job runs. And the only data that execute method is allowed to access in the job is the fields of that struct. So everything that the job needs has to be a struct on that field. And so you instantiate the job, you call the schedule method, it gets put on the queue of all the jobs, and the job system itself will then decide uh, when to pull jobs off the queue and run them on one of the threads. The job system itself is, is maintaining a pool of threads, uh, worker threads. And when one of those threads goes idle, when, when it has nothing to do, the job system can just grab something else off the queue and throw it on that, that core, throw it on that worker thread. And then the job will run on that thread and only that thread until it's done. And, and then that thread is available for something else. So that is the basic pattern. Um, now, very importantly, in, in concurrent programming and writing multi-threaded code, the, the issue that what makes it hard is synchronizing access to data. And so what can happen with your jobs is they're self-contained except for the part where they access collections. And so possibly you might have job A and job B that say are both touching the same native array. And what you want almost always is you want one of those jobs to finish, at, uh, run and finish execution before the other one. You don't want it to be indeterminate of which runs first and you don't want their execution to overlap because that can lead to all sorts of race conditions and, and weird things happening. So you want to be able to schedule jobs, these two jobs, and tell the job system, I know they touch the same data, but you should run this one before this other one. Um, so that's what a dependency allows you to do. When you schedule a job, you can tell the job system, hey, this new job I'm scheduling, there's this other job that's already been scheduled. I want that to be the dependency. And so this new job has to wait for that other job to finish before it'll be pulled off the queue. So you can, in fact, um, have a job with many dependencies and itself be the, de the dependency of many other jobs. And so you can form these long chains of elaborate chains of jobs if you need to. Um, and so you can just create all those jobs uh, with the appropriate dependencies, throw them on the queue, and then the job system handles the details of precisely which ones run in what order, but it'll, it'll respect those dependencies. It'll, it'll make sure that all the uh, job's dependencies are fin are, have already finished before that job runs. Now, uh, another key feature, again, is back to the safety checks. Um, you don't want to mis forget to add those dependencies. And so when you run in the editor, the safety checks, at least when turned on by default, um, they will catch cases where you try and schedule a job that you that touches a collection that some other job already sitting on the queue or, or already running. It'll, it'll catch the cases if there's a, a conflict between them, if they both touch the same native collection. Um, and it'll throw an error when you try and schedule the second job. And that's a really good thing because you don't want to have those, those mistakes hiding in your code. Um, do be clear though, that you don't want to unnecessarily create dependencies. You don't want to have, if two jobs A and B have no shared data, then there's no reason that generally that they shouldn't be able to run in parallel. And so you wouldn't want to have a dependency between them because then one of them would have to finish before the other can start. And that of course would not be great. Um, and last thing to say about the job system is uh, you might be wondering, well, what about cycles. Like what if I have two jobs that both depend upon each other in a cyclic way, in a recursively cyclic way? Um, that obviously would be bad 
because job A would have to wait for job B, but meanwhile, job B would be waiting for job A and they'd, they'd both be deadlocked. They both would never work, uh, start running even. Th that obviously would be that bad. You don't want that. Well, happily, you don't really have to think about that in the job system because um, it, the API just simply doesn't make it possible. You, you can't even schedule that in, in the first place. So don't really have to worry about it. So that's the job system. Uh, and then the burst compiler uh, is simply a, <coughs> a C sharp compiler that does a bunch of aggressive optimizations that a regular C sharp compiler cannot and will not do. And the reason that burst can do these optimizations is because it is compiling not just any C sharp code, but only code that conforms to a subset of C sharp that we call HPC sharp, standing for high performance C sharp. So if you're writing HPC sharp code, um, you have to stick to a number of restrictions. There's a lot of finicky rules, most of which you don't have to worry about because they're really, really edge, small edge cases. But the big one, the big thing you have to not do is you can't use managed objects. And, and happily, that turns out to be basically the same requirement for your jobs. Is, you know, so, so basically, most any job you write, you should be able to burst compile it. And in fact, all you have to do really to burst compile your jobs is just throw on the, uh, the, the burst compiler attribute on that job. And then that signals, hey, this should be burst compiled. And that's basically all you have to do. So, so burst is pretty much like, it's, it's free, free performance, it's magic. It's the closest thing in dots to magic. It's, it's the part where you don't have to do the work. For jobs, you have to you know, express your, your, your code in form of jobs. And that can be a little difficult. That's, that's an extra burden on you. With entities, as we'll see, as we'll see later, like that's a whole new way of writing code. But with burst, as long as you already have jobs, you don't have to do anything pretty much. Um, the only reason you would want to turn off burst, uh, basically, let me, let me go back to my slide so that doesn't bug me. Um, the only reason you would probably want to turn off burst in most cases is just in development, you want to debug and you can step debug burst code, but um, it can be a little flaky sometimes. It's not not perfect. So sometimes you turn it off so you can uh, better, better debug your code, but only temporarily for development purposes. Um, so you're probably wondering what kind of optimizations does burst do? Um, it's a number of things, but uh, probably the, the main one in most cases, the, the biggest thing is that a regular compiler in C Sharp or C++ for that matter, is not really going to utilize SIMD, probably at all in most cases. SIMD are CPU instructions um, that perform arithmetic and bit logic operations on mass. So instead of, for example, um, a, a regular add instruction, for example, just takes a single pair of numbers and gives you back the result. But then a SIMD add instruction will take will multiply. Uh, sorry, add together uh, multiple pairs of numbers, uh, say like eight, depending upon the processor, and on until it's typically eight. So you're getting you know much more work done in a single instruction compared to regular arithmetic, and it doesn't necessarily run exactly in the same number of CPU cycles, but close to it. So so it's close to like an eight x speed up basically for that for that work. You're basically getting eight times the amount of work or uh, done in about the same amount of time. So if you can utilize these effectively, particularly in code that does a lot of computation in big loops, like if you can uh, have your compiler generate SIMD code for that in, in a smart way, you can get really big performance benefits. Um, with Burst, it is not uncommon to see performance gains of like 10x, that is, that is really not uncommon. The average is maybe more like 4x to 6x, but that's still huge. We're talking about like 400% to 600%. Um, on an average case, which is way better than typically what you expect from compiler optimizations. Usually we're excited to get like 3% performance gains out of compiler optimizations, and this is way, way better. To, to be sure, you know, it's, it's not total magic and it depends on what your code does precisely. You know, there are going to be cases where maybe Burst can't do all that much in optimization. And so you get only minor, minor gains or, um, or potentially even a small regression. Um, but those are rare cases. Most of the important stuff you want to do, performance sensitive code, doing a lot of math, you're going to get big wins out of burst. So, um, oops, back to that slide. So, so last uh, here of the, the first four packages, mathematics. Very simply, it is a mathematics library. Uh, but what's special about it is that it has hooks into burst. You can, um, uh, w w when a mathematics function is compiled by burst, it has hints to burst telling it, hey, you should utilize such and such CPU instruction um, that is optimal for this particular math operation. Because even in, those, in, in many cases, Burst can't necessarily figure it out for uh, particular kinds of math operations. So that's what mathematics is about. You, know, you just use it like any other math library pretty much, and not, not too much to, to know about it. It's just another math library to learn that's very similar to existing ones. So pretty straightforward there. And so now let's see. So these four, first four packages, again, 
you know, using dots without entities, be clear that all this stuff is production ready. Um, well, collections is actually not quite out of preview, but it will be very soon. Um, it's, it's imminently going to be released out of preview. Um, and so you can use these all today. And, and that can be a very effective thing to do in a lot of cases in the context of a game that otherwise you don't think of as being dots. A lot of people think of dots as being synonymous with ECS, but that's not really the case. Um, you can use these four things and per, say you have some hard computation problem that is slowing down your frames. If you can isolate that problem, that one feature, you can, in many cases, find an opportunity to express that in terms of jobs and, and burst, burst compiled jobs. The only trick is that, well, in the context of a, um, of a game object based game, you know, a typical Unity game, basically everything you have is managed objects. And so the problem you have is you need to get your data in an unmanaged form so that you can pass it into jobs. And then when you get the results back, um, use those jobs in the context of your managed objects. So that does imply in some cases you need to end up, you'll end up copying data from, from, a, from the managed world into the unmanaged world, feed it into your jobs, get back the results and then copy it back to your managed uh, world. That, in, of course, in some cases that all that copying, if you're doing that every frame, doing a lot of copying for that purpose, that could, you know, eat away the benefits of, of using jobs in some cases. So you have to watch out for that. In a lot of cases, though, maybe you don't need to do all that much data copying, and so you're fine. Um, and then in some cases, the solution, what you can do is maybe that data doesn't need to be in an unmanaged, uh, sorry, in a managed form at all to begin with. You can just have it always stay in an unmanaged form in the first place. That way you don't have to do all this copying back and forth. And, and be clear, like regular managed uh, C sharp uh, Unity code that can deal with managed uh, un that can deal with unmanaged objects just fine. There's no restriction there, so that often is a is a viable solution, which I, I think actually is what Roger's example is going to look like. So uh, I have no idea how long it took. I apologize if it went too fast. Yeah, that was more like 20 minutes. So um, when we get to entities, maybe I'll have to. I might have to rush pretty quickly, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll stay over the 90 minutes to answer questions. So, so don't worry about that part. Um, so I'll hand things over to, to Roger. Hello. So yeah, we will have actually the example done with the recording. So we are sure that nothing crashes, nothing goes wrong and profiles work properly so that we don't lose time because it's very dense. And we know that it's very dense. and we have already seen some people feel a little bit lost or overwhelmed by all those new things. And yes, you basically learn a new engine in some way with the dot stack, but what you get for it is so powerful and so um, novel and new that it's definitely worthwhile to uh, look into. So during the time while the video plays, don't be afraid to answer, ask questions. We will try to answer them in the background or we will select them to discuss live. Some of them are a little bit broader in terms of like, you know, mindset change or do I need to lose everything I learned up to now to be able to use dots um, and some of them are of course need to be a little bit more discussed so continue to ask questions we love those questions we think many of them have uh, a lot of relevance and we will try our best to answer them and also no one currently is an expert in dots except maybe with the unity team themselves because it's so new and data and programming has not existed for that long and burst is new everything is new so it's the perfect time to ask questions and be worrisome about certain things because that's the perfect time where we will learn what is still needed, what we can improve and how we can best teach those concepts that you're completely good with it. So let's jump into the videos and there's also a poll that's mainly for us to know like where you stand. Have you already worked with DOTS or even with ECS? Have you already maybe shipped a product which uses DOTS? Uh, it would be very interesting for us to know where you currently stand that we also know the audience a little bit and tone things down or up for the next iteration where we talk about dots again. Perfect. So um, yeah, we are running the hands-on part right now. Uh, please continue the discussion on chat, but don't submit your questions on the chat. It is very difficult for us to find. So we will also run a few polls just to understand the expectations from this workshop, from dots and the level of the audience so we can and share more details according to the audience. So, um, yeah. Welcome to Unleashing the Power of Dots. We will walk you through a small and a little bit contrived example of how you can use the production ready parts of the dot stack to enhance your current applications, even though they're built fully in mono behavior land. So a little bit 
about the speakers today or who helped prepare this presentation. First, we have Dreaming I'm Latios. If you have ever been on the Unity forums um, since basically ECS or DOTS uh, existed and you had any questions, chances are that you got a very friendly and helpful answer from this person. He has been very helpful in within the whole community and has given advice on the most complicated problems we had um, and also even created his own framework called the latest framework which is built on top of the dot stack so if you ever build an ecs focused application in unity i would heavily recommend that you at least check out his framework he gives solutions to many things which all which often crop up on the forums which people have problems with like shared containers uh, as well as singletons and all of the other things which have been solved in a very interesting way and also, if you want to see very advanced DOTS implementations, please check out this framework. There is a lot of example codes which are very helpful. Uh, about myself, I have started more as an economist, then moved to being a bioengineer, and then finally became a computer scientist, and then uh, worked in a few companies, and now started together with Dennis Conard uh, Holonautic, where we are basically exploring the cutting-edge technologies in spatial computing as well as uh, inside Unity to try to squeeze out the most interesting things possible in the current domain. But enough about uh, how that all got created, now about the challenge. So we have a certain task to do. So one thing happened, uh, your boss actually fell in love um, just a few days ago and he really uh, has his brain chemistry completely altered to that and now he wants to spread that information to everyone in the world. And of course he wants to use the currently published um, experience to have hearts everywhere that he can showcase his love to everyone. Evidently, um, we have to have a certain frame rate uh, to be targeted that the users can still play it, although that heart promotion is actually running. And the main thing is uh, do it fast, don't ask too many questions and just get it done basically. So you go back to your desk and you think, okay, you know that that heart promotion will probably not last very long. It's very likely that brain chemistry will go back to normal and we all realize that that heart promotion was not the best thing. So we don't want to spend too many days on figuring out a good strategy to make it happen. Although we want to please our superiors that they think it's perfectly implemented. So our first strategy is just to spawn little hearts, make them pulsate and animate in the level and we spawn as many as we can that it feels like the whole level is filled with hearts. And in the first implementation, we do not care about frame rates. We just care about getting the right number of hearts that it feels that it works well. We also don't try to do it um, very sophisticated. We really do the simplest way possible. Here in Unity, we can see we have used the 3D game kit, which probably most of you have already played around with, to have a complete game. And to that complete implementation, we added the hearts promotion um, as, a, as an additional feature. And if I press play here, you will see um, it's the second level of the 3D game kit. And there is basically nothing else in there currently. And we also added a little bit of a FPS counter on the side that we can see how many frames we have. So as we see here in the normal game, uh, we have exactly 60 frames per second, on average it's 60 frames per second. So that is a perfectly playable experience. And now we start to add um, the hearts promotion to add that additional features which we got requested to add in a very short amount of time. To add that, we added a hearts manager. And as you can see here, it's just a mono behavior with an additional component. It's called the heart promo manager. What we have here, we just have the hearts prefab. Uh, we have a spawn zone to indicate where the hearts will be spawned. And we have a list of all the heart objects. We also have a total number of hearts um, variable, which we can adjust in the editor to just move them those hearts up and down. In addition, there is some boilerplate code, but the main uh, interesting part is we just, uh, on awake, we instantiate and spawn uh, the number of hearts, which we defined in the editor, uh, in a random location of that spawning volume. And then each heart has a separate logic on it to actually rotate, which we can see here in the hearts promo logic, each of those uh, just oscillate a little bit and bump a little bit up and down and rotate. And that's basically the, the animation we added to the hearts. So once we have this, we can go into Unity and we set it in the beginning just to a thousand hearts. Uh, and the red volume you can see here is just the, the spawning volume uh, which we spawn all those hearts. And we try to make it big enough that it encompasses basically the whole level. 
So let's quickly press play. Okay, let's have a look on how it is if we spawn in the in the full level a thousand hearts. As we can see here, we don't see any of them. Uh, it looks like actually that we, the thousand hearts we spawned never got created. Oh yes, here we see a small little heart currently um, being displayed, but it definitely doesn't look like there are many, many hearts in that level. It's just one tiny one there. Now the question is of course, um, might it be that we actually didn't spawn the 1000? We have some kind of error with the logic, but as you can see here, a lot of those are definitely there. The main problem is just that there are a thousand hearts in that size of a level is just not enough. Um, so of course, uh, the next step is we have to find out which number of hearts do we actually need to get to something acceptable. And we, you do it with an increment of a, a one power of magnitude. So instead of a thousand, we spawn now 10,000 and we will have another look and see if that will be enough uh, to have a convincing heart promotion going on. Um, so let's have a look around. Now we can see there, it's more easier to spot a few hearts, right? It's There are a few... Um, but it still doesn't feel like there's a lot of love going on in um, this level. So let's bump it up by another uh, order of magnitude and let's see what happens when we spawn 100,000 hearts in that level. And of course we don't worry about performance at this stage. We just say, okay, how many hearts would be needed with the most simple logic that we just spawned it all over the place. And we can see like with 100,000 hearts, um, it looks like, yeah, that's about the number which feels like okay there's a lot of hearts uh, being around and it feels more or less good of course the frame rate is probably not uh, anywhere in the level of acceptable but at least we have determined that with a hundred thousand hearts we can actually launch that promotion and it feel, will feel good enough now let me go back uh, here and we get to the results of that first iteration um, we have a slight problem uh, so the hearts are there, we are really happy, but the three frames a second from the initial 60 is uh, actually very terrible. And um, we found the required number of hearts, but we also see that when we look into the profiler, we see that that hearts promotion logic, like the update method, which spawns those hearts, and then each of those uh, 100,000 instances of the hearts, they take together uh, 83 milliseconds, which is definitely nowhere to be acceptable. But So we cannot have a hundred thousand game objects in the world and expect the hearts promotion to be playable in any feasible manner. Now for the second iteration. As we saw before, a hundred thousand hearts as game objects being displayed at the same time without any additional logic is just not feasible. So we go for a different strategy. We know that a hundred thousand hearts are necessary to make it feel like there is really a hearts promotion going on. But those hearts don't need to be presented as game objects all the time because we cannot see most of them. So we go for a pooling strategy and we only represent virtual hearts, the 100,000. And then from those 100,000 virtual hearts, which are randomly distributed, we will focus on the 1,000 which are closest to the camera and inside the view frostum that we can basically use a pooling technique. As soon as we move the camera around, we basically only display the one the one thousand hearts of the 100,000s which are currently closest and inside the view frost. That should give us a better performance because we don't have 100,000 game objects all at the same time being animated and uh, consuming logic. We only have a thousand but the player should barely notice the difference because he will only see the ones which are close to him, the ones behind him as well as those far away will actually not be visible. So let's go into code and see how uh, that was implemented. Again, do not focus too much on the implementation part uh, of this as that is not the important part. The more important part is it's about the strategy of how can you get to better performance while using data abstractions and virtualization of things. So for example, here we have uh, the hard data, which is implements a comparable and it has a position, a distance to the camera, an index, which we'll use to define uh, which is currently visible. And it has a Boolean to know if that heart is currently actually visible or not based on the view for them. And then we also have a compare method, which allows us afterwards to sort all those 100,000 um, hearts, which we create by giving the ones which are currently visible a priority. So if 
the one is currently visible compared to another heart, then that one has priority. And if both of them are visible, uh, basically if the result is zero, then we prioritize the one which is currently closer to the camera. This is basically a custom sort function based on our requirements of which hearts we wanna be sorted first when we sort an array of those virtual hearts. And the rest is very similar. We have just camera planes, etc. We instantiate the hearts exactly as before. We have a heart pool count now of a limited number of hearts instead of the 100,000. And then in the update method, we basically go through all the hearts which we have and we check them the bounds of them for that we use the unity's implemented uh, geometry utility to test which one are in the view frosting of the camera and we also calculate the distance from the camera the hearts are and then from that we can use our custom sorting function to get the first 1000 hearts which are the most um, closest and inside the view frosten and we then do some swapping logic uh, you don't need to worry about that here we just swap the hearts that those which are currently visible and the close to the camera are in front of the array and those are the ones where the pool then gets the position set to and so we can have then only 1000 hearts and prioritize the ones which are currently visible and if you go back to unity and press play we can see uh, we still have the impression like there are 100,000 hearts because they're visible all over uh, the level and we currently have around 15 to maybe maximum 20 frames a second and that's not really there yet it's already much better than what we had before but it's not really playable yet and the good part is that we only have a thousand hearts uh, as game objects actually represented but it still looks like that we have a real hearts promotion going on in the game and now when we look at the profiler from the currently running process, we can see that the Hearts Pro Manager, this logic, the update logic, where we sort and um, handle all the hearts, is actually the one which takes up the most time. It takes up nearly 50 milliseconds. And so we have to find a way, although we are on the right path, as we can see, we definitely have better performance than before. We still need to find a way to update that sorting and prioritizing logic in a, in a good way that we get to an acceptable uh, frame rate. And if we summarize uh, what happened before is basically we reach around 15 to maybe 20 frames per second. We still know that the bottleneck is the update function and sorting step is very expensive. Uh, we also have many threads which are sitting idle. Uh, when we go back to the profiler, we can see that here in the job, we can see that nearly all of those threads, the worker threads from one to 14 in this particular machines, a machine are just sitting idle and don't do anything uh, while the main thread is extremely busy. So of course there, we, if we do, can do some kind of parallelization and improvements, then probably it could help us to get to a higher frame rate. And also we see that the main bottleneck here is the update function and we will look uh, in the next iteration how to improve that. Version 3. In the third iteration, we try a different strategy to get a little bit better at what we did before. So we have noticed that we have a few threads which are just sitting there not doing anything. So it would be probably a smart idea to start to put some of the work which are currently done on the main thread on those worker threads so the main thread can do something else. Um, so to do that, we use one in, uh, feature of the dot stack, which is the jobs. The jobs allow you to schedule um, certain tasks to be done, not just on the main thread, but actually uh, to be done on worker threads and even further down the line on multiple worker threads at the same time. But we will come to that. But to use the jobs, there are certain restrictions which apply. So what uh, type of jobs you can execute um, need to have certain data types and certain functions are not yet fully available. So for example, we need to implement our custom sort function uh, because the array.sort, for example, is not really available in the dots job stack that you can directly use that. It has a few restrictions. I don't go into detail now, but just be aware that we had to implement our custom sort function as well as a custom uh, frost and check function because the one which uh, came from the um, geometry utilities could not be directly run inside the jobs. And when we go uh, directly to the code, because the actual, uh, in the implementation, nothing changed. Uh, it's more like in code where we see a lot of things change. So we have the hearts pool job, uh, which implements the I job interface. And the only method which you need to implement is the execute method. It just means that here you will do the work and you have to pass in 
all um, the data points which that execute method will operate on. Again, if you are new to the dot stack and you, uh, it's a little bit overwhelming, don't worry about it. Just focus on the higher level picture of the strategy. It's, we can run certain things uh, on worker threads instead of the main thread by implementing that iJob interface. Here, we just go through all the pool records, which is a new data type um, we added. Uh, it's just an optimization strategy where we have the position of the heart and then decide if we should write um, that heart to this frame. So if we need to update the position of this heart, this frame, or if it was already visible in the last um, frame. Um, that's just a little optimization that we don't need to update the position of hearts, which were already vis visible um, during the last iteration. And we go here through all the hearts. Uh, we do a similar strategy as we had before. We calculate the distance to the camera. Here we actually approximate it with the uh, distance square because it's good enough for our implementation and it is faster than calculating the actual distance. Um, and then we have a custom test planes function, which allows us to check if something is inside the view for us. Uh, we use the dots product. It's just a approximation, but it's good enough working in this example. And then we have our custom sort function uh, for the hearts array, where we go through and basically uh, and sort all those hearts to be the first 1000 to be there when they are inside the view for us and close to the camera. And then we go through all the hearts and swap again the hearts around and uh, adjust the position of those actual game object hearts to be the ones of the thousand closest to the camera and inside the view for them. For the test planes one, we just use a dot product here to check if it's inside the plane, inside of those six planes. Um, use the AND operation to check if it's inside uh, the view frosting. Don't worry too much about the implementation details here. You can afterwards uh, take a look at it. And the sort function uh, uses uh, the typical quick sort implementation, uh, which you can find online. Um, it's a very well known sorting algorithm. It's not necessarily always the fastest, but it works very well for this uh, type of problem, as you will see later. And afterwards, the main new part is we have to uh, create all the data structures evidently for that we also need to allocate them one thing is if you use jobs and the dot system um, those data structures uh, and arrays are not uh, taken care of for you like that's usually the case with modern behavior in c sharp you actually when you have data structures like arrays you actually need to allocate them and in the destroy method you need to dispose of them as we can see here uh, on destroy, we dispose of all those uh, arrays which we allocated with the persistence um, modifier because we basically create those arrays, but we are then responsible also to dispose of them once the work is done with those arrays. It's not automatically taken care of, but that allows you to have basically no garbage collection and have gives you a better performance overall um, by you doing it that way. So we have the hard data, the pool records, and then just the six planes which we need to do the calculations. And I walk through this implementation very quickly. And again, it should just give you the higher level picture of what we did. And the more important part is like the strategy or the tools you have in the dot stack rather than the actual implementation. Uh, here we do exactly the same thing as before. Um, and then we go through them, set the main camera. And then in the updates method, uh, we add a little tool that we can toggle between using the worker threads and running it on the main thread to see what is the performance we actually gain by running something on the worker thread instead of on the main thread. And then we calculate all the planes. We set that, that those planes um, to be used um, based on uh, for every update as the planes change when the user changes the camera. Then we create that job and we pass in the data points which the job needs to execute. If we use the worker threads, then we use the schedule method, otherwise we use the run. So when you call the schedule method, then the Unity will basically decide for you if that method should be run on the main thread or on a worker thread. It's not guaranteed to run on a worker thread. Uh, with the run method, it's guaranteed to run. It's basically a synchronous execution. So you can directly apply the records because you are guaranteed after the run has been called that the, the job is basically finished. If you schedule it and then you schedule uh, the whole jobs, um, then you basically have to call complete before you can apply uh, the next method on the finished job. And that's why we give the thread a little bit of time and we only in late update 
uh, if the worker threads are used, we actually complete the job and then we apply the records, which is just setting the actual position of the pooled hearts uh, to the correct ones, which we have in the in the pool records. And the pool records are just there that uh, the thousand hearts, which we actually need, get clearly identified and they also know if they have been visible or not in the last frame for a small optimization. Anyway, a lot of code, but the main important part is we have now the opportunity to execute work, not just on the main thread, but actually on a worker thread. Although with the caveat that we have to probably implement a few functions like the sorting and the frosting calling on our own. So let's go back to Unity and click play and see what the performance benefits are uh, when we run something actually on a worker thread. So we can see here, nothing changed yet because we're still running everything on the main thread. So we quickly uh, type on J. So now we start to use worker threads and we can see that the performance is exactly the same or even slightly worse. Um, let's have a look at the profiler because something is weird. So we should see um, that the job is now executed on a worker thread instead of the main thread. Um, if Unity decided to actually run it um, on the worker thread. And we can see here that the heartspool.update function is run on a worker thread and it takes up a lot of time. And the actual late update function has to wait for that job to be completed. So although we moved the work away from the main thread, because the late update needs to wait for it, we actually didn't gain anything. Um, as you can see here, like the, the, the performance is basically equal or worse. It's not executed on the main thread, but it takes either the same amount of time or even more because we actually have to do all the scheduling to be able to work on a different thread than the main thread. And so it looks like all the work we did to use the job system was actually not worth it. Um, it just made things worse. Uh, we can see that here that the Hearts promo logic, um, although it's running on a worker thread and not on the main thread, it just takes basically the same amount of time and we didn't gain anything. The frames stayed exactly the same. So um, it looks like we the job system is not really worth much if you have an operation which is taking up a lot of time and you need it to complete in the same frame, which is most of the time the case. Um, but wait, there's one thing which the dot stack also offers. Apart from the jobs which you can run on worker threads and basically do uh, asynchronous computation uh, in, in, a, in a smart way, you also have Burst. Um, and Burst is probably one of the most exciting technology pieces uh, which are available for unit developers now. Um, of course, it's relatively complicated. You need to add the burst compile attribute to a job that it is burst compiled. Um, and when you, if you wonder if that is really everything we need to do, it's actually true. Once you have a job function done in a proper way, like with burstable types, etc., as we did here, then the only code change you need to do that you can use burst is to add that attribute um, on top of the job. And Burst is, um, let me first show you what Burst actually can do. Um, so here, let's try to rerun um, the whole simulation. It should have recompiled. And now let's see what happens when we run exactly the same implementation, but this time with Burst. And look at this, we somehow are nearly running at 40 frames, from 30 to 40 frames a second. Um, it's suddenly become a lot smoother. So let's let's have a closer look of what actually happened when we look at the profiler. So interestingly enough, like when we look here, the hearts pool job update, the the method before which run on the worker thread. Oh yeah, we have to actually run it on the worker thread. Um, let's continue the analysis and run it actually on the worker thread, so we can easily see how much time it actually takes. So here we are way above the frame rate we had before and let's have a quick look on that job being executed on one of the worker threads. So we're just adding burst compile to it. The job runs a lot faster than before. And actually when, when we uh, look at that from before, here we saw uh, it run in 11 milliseconds 
when we look at the profiler and we look for that worker thread and we see that the hearts job which before took up a lot more time we can see that the time was vastly reduced compared to before and we can see that basically here the job gets scheduled and then it completes in late update and the time it took is vastly inferior to before so when we actually look closer the update function wait went from around 40 milliseconds to four minutes so we have a roughly 10x improvement by just adding that small burst compile on top of the method um and that's just the fascinating part about burst burst basically understands the mathematics code and the other code you write um to its intrinsic parts and optimizes it for the processor to be executed in the most optimal way possible so it's it gives you a possibility to actually run code as fast as if you manually by hand optimized it uh, in the C++ land. Like if you would um, try to get the best performance possible out of your code by aligning everything correctly in memory and doing the, the perfect alignment so that the least amount of machine instructions are used. That's basically what Burst does for you in, in general. And it's incredible how much performance boost you can actually get with that by just adding a little uh, burst compile on top of a job and that is what makes the whole thing incredibly powerful that's one of the main things why the dot stack becomes so interesting yes you are restricted in the data types you can use and how you have to write those jobs but once you write them correctly you can use burst and it just catapults the performance by a factor by orders of magnitude and depending on what you do it can even be more than 10x um, but of course we, we're not finished yet so we now go to the fourth iteration. When we go for the fourth iteration, we notice that um, we basically have one job now doing everything. And what if we would actually split up that one single job, which does all the work into multiple? Because if we have multiple jobs doing their work, uh, we can actually distribute them over multiple worker threads as long as they don't depend on each other. But if they do depend on each other, then we can use the dependency management, uh, which basically handles all of that for us uh, with having multiple things doing things concurrently. And we don't need to worry as much about uh, read and write access to the data because Unity basically provides an easy, to, easy way to actually handle all of that. Um, so we decided to go with the pool records reset. That's the resetting we do in the beginning as a separate job. Then we do the calling, like testing if something should be visible or not and how close it is to the camera as a separate job. And the sorting as well is now a separate job. And then the swapping job where we um, exchange the ones which should be visible or not to be in the beginning. And then those hard, real hearts get the correct positions of those hearts which are currently visible. Those are the four jobs we want to separate off everything to. And we also see here the job dependency is basically that the resetting of the of all the variables from before. That doesn't need to happen in the beginning. It can actually happen during other jobs work. It just needs to be finished before we do the swapping. Because on the swapping there, we basically set the if it should be writing this frame or not. Then we have the calling job, which needs to happen before the sorting job, as the calling information is important for the sorting job to know which hearts are have higher priorities than the others. So let's quickly jump into the actual implementation. And here we have um, the fourth version of uh, the code. And the main thing is that we have um, the same hard data. We have the same um, pool records as we saw before. The reset job is now separated and that is a very simple job and it uses the ijob4 um, implementation. That is basically a job which takes an index into account. So the execute method gets that index and the ijob4 usually uh, operate on arrays um, and get the index from that array element. And then we get out the record, the pull record, and we just set the write this frame to false. And then we apply back to the array that the data is actually written. As we all know, struct structs are actually passed by value, not by reference. And so we have to assign it back to the, to the native array. And that is the only thing this job does. And the interesting part is here, you don't need to handle actually the array directly because you get the index of where to operate it on. Um, and there's another few benefits you get if you implement the iJob4 um, interface. Then we have uh, the hard calling job, which also implements the same one. Here we go just through the array of hearts. 
um, and step through each one of them and test uh, if they are visible or not and the distance from the camera. The main important part is as iJob 4s are possible to run on multiple threads, multiple worker threads, they actually all can be executed in a concurrent way, which is extremely powerful, but it has one restriction. You cannot um, just write to all types of arrays which you pass in. You can only write to the array where you pass the index in. So Unity knows that you're currently operating on that area and no, nothing else basically writes to the same area while you execute that job. That's why the planes area, which we don't actually modify in that function, we need to indicate that it's a read only array. So that way we can actually schedule the job, not just on one thread, but actually multiple threads, which allows it to run um, in a lot more efficient way if we have a few worker threads available. So those are jobs then the sorting job is exactly the same thing as we have before and execute we just do the sorting of everything and that should uh, basically lead to the exact same performance now just we can schedule it on after um, other jobs have been run or so certain jobs could run in parallel if they don't depend the sorting doesn't depend on the one on the finishing them beforehand and then we have the swapping job which just does the same uh, code as before now just as a separate job so that's all that is needed and then here we just schedule all those jobs so we have the reset job for the resetting one we just schedule that one and we can pass in a dependency and as we saw here in this one this job will have no prior dependencies but the hard scrolling job also can start at any point in time but the sorting job needs to depend on the calling job and as well as the hard swapping job needs to depend on both the hard sorting job and the pool records job to be finished beforehand and this we can see here that this one has default means just it doesn't depend on anything beforehand the same is true for the hard calling job that one doesn't depend on anything, but the sorting job here depends on the calling job, which we defined here. So this one gets passed in as a dependency. That means it will only run the sorting job once the calling job is finished. And in the end, we then need to have the two jobs combined. So the resetting job and the sorting job are then combined into a new dependency and that one uh, gets passed into the hard swapping job because we saw before those at uh, the swapping job needs to have both um, the calling and sorting job to be finished as well as the resetting job to be finished and by doing that basically unity can guarantee and analyze the code in that way that we know that this job will not run before the others two have finished and then we just schedule all those jobs and in the late update to give them a little bit more time we complete them and then we apply the records as we did before so let's have a quick look into Unity, what that actually helps with, if it actually improves or decreases performance, and it, what the main usages of that. So as we can see, uh, that separation of jobs sometimes helps when they are, when we are basically having the same camera position, but as soon as we move around or move the camera, it still is better than before but it's not perfect. So let's maybe have a look what the main difference is when we go into the profiler to see um, what actually happened um, with those jobs. Are they scheduled in a way which, they, which we hope for, that they're on multiple worker threads and can distribute the work more evenly? So we have here the hearts sorting job, uh, which takes up a lot of time, uh, actually nine milliseconds. And we have the hard calling job, which also takes up nearly one millisecond. And because they both depend on each other, even if you run them on a worker thread, it, they don't benefit a lot from it because they're basically having to be run one after the other. And we see that the, the little uh, swapping job, which happens after those two, uh, is very short and doesn't need a lot of optimization. So when we look at those results, like it already is better, but splitting up those job into separate ones doesn't bring as much because most of them in this specific scenario actually depend on each other. So we cannot paralyze the work in, in a good way. The, and evidently the calling job and the sorting job are the most expensive. So what if we are actually looking at our current problem and see what we can do to improve it? Let's start to be smart about the sorting. And also let's try to distribute actually the the calling job, not just on one thread, because that one can easily be multi-threaded because each data 
is operated on individually. And if the calling job can get faster, basically our bottleneck gets a lot faster. So let's go into that. So we know that the hard, the hard sorting job takes, a, takes up quite a bit of time. And also the calling job takes up not a quite significant portion of, of the performance. So let's go back into Unity and see what happens when we implement those improvements. So back in the editor, we can see that the sorting job, what can we do? We know that we need to have the 1000 best hearts to display, but actually the order of those 1000 hearts doesn't matter to us as much. I mean, if the first 1000 hearts in, are in the correct order based on the distance of the camera, or if they're completely jumbled up, we actually don't care. We also can know that the last uh, few hearts, as long as uh, the ones after the 1000 hearts which we care about, they can be in any order. So we actually can do an early out on this algorithm, on the quicksort algorithm, if we um, take those two conditions into account, if we know that the the index we're currently looking at is actually like inside that pool of hearts which we care about, then we don't need to continue sorting it further down. And that's a particularity on that quicksort algorithm. And the same is true if you are way uh, beyond the part where we actually of those 1000 hearts, if that one gets sorted correctly, we don't care about. So that's a way where we can do an early out. And the interesting part is here that you, thanks to Burst, you can implement a custom sorting function and run it at the same performance as you would uh, when you would be an engine developer and had access to C++ bindings and do some kind of magic there because Burst gives you raw metal performance, which is basically close to the absolute optimum you can get. So you can implement your custom functions and don't need to rely on other libraries, which maybe had access to the underlying architecture of Unity that you that they could implement something faster. For example, the NavMesh agents definitely have an advantage from Unity because they run um, inside of the engine code and so they can do optimizations which other NavMesh frames maybe couldn't have done. But now with the burst compiler and the job system and all of that, you actually can get to the same performance as the Unity engine uh, came to. So you're not any more limited. You don't live anymore in two different worlds and only one part you can do and you can only do so much. You can actually can now get to the same level of performance as Unity did by doing their implementation, which opens up a huge amount of possibilities for uh, for parties to give solutions to the Unity engine, which run as fast or uh, which are basically on par and have no restrictions compared to the Unity engine directly having that implemented, which is extremely exciting. Um, and you already can see the little bit on the asset store of those developers which have taken up the job system and the burst compiler to actually optimize a lot of their implementations, especially when they were uh, very computational heavy. And the second part of the optimization, apart from being smart about the sorting job, is that we, instead of running it on one thread, we just run it on multiple threads. The calling job can easily be paralyzed, uh, paralyzed because we don't care about the previous or the next um, data point on that calling entity. It's just like one which needs to be looked at. And the only thing we need to change to actually be able to do that is we have to implement the iJob4 interface and we have to do a schedule parallel. Then we have to give the length of the array and just uh, we define an inner loop batch count of 16. Um, the number here is a little bit difficult to explain what what is the optimal here. Often you use the profiler to figure out what is the best, but usually you go by a multiple, multiple of two, so two, four, eight, or 16, 32, etc. And this job doesn't depend on anything. So by just doing those small changes, let's see if we see any performance improvements when we run this the application again. So here we should now see, especially when we go into the profiler, that the calling job now is distributed over multiple frames and the sorting should be a little bit better. So as we can see here, we are now averaging around 47 frames a second, sometimes even higher, depending on how warmed up it is and how the recording is currently going on. Um, stay here. Yes, we can see it's actually running on a quite better frame rate. But let's have a look at the actual profiler and let's see if we can find out what is happening. So the first question, of course, we have is, is the calling job distributed over multiple frames? And we can actually see through the profiler indication that even though it's not equally distributed, it's definitely distributed over multiple frames. And we can see that each job itself takes 
0 0.3 milliseconds and the total is 2.52 milliseconds of those 16 instances so that definitely helped to distribute the whole even though the actual total time of those 16 instances is longer the the time it takes for them to finish um, is actually faster because it's distributed over multiple threads so the actual time it took for that to finish is 0 0.3 milliseconds and even though in total it took uh, 2.5 milliseconds and then we also have the hearts sorting job and that got a vast improvement instead of n log n we actually are more at the 2n of complexity with that algorithm just because we figured out that we could early out because we don't care about the perfect sorting order of those hearts once they are inside the pool size or outside of the pool size so it means with those small simple clever implementations one using uh, primarily the job system of unity and the easy way to multi-thread something and distribute over multiple threads and the concurrence and all of the other stuff they implemented and the other one is just being smart about a custom algorithm of figuring out how to improve on that so we can see uh, so we early out we distribute the calling job over multiple threads and that actually led to us to be get very close to 60 frames we have a performance a sorting with the highest performance now is instead of 2.7 seconds it went down to 3 milliseconds when I recorded that without uh, the recording going on and the calling job is now distributed over multiple frames as you can see here and here the total is one nearly 2 milliseconds but because we distributed them over multiple frame the whole thing is actually taking up 0 0.1 milliseconds in total so distributing that calling job over multiple frames ha had additional advantages and that's why having burst and being smart with a burst with, with the implementation of burst actually can give you a huge amount of benefits and we are very close to the 60 frames a second which we definitely want to target uh, with that hearts promotion logic but it's not the end let's go and have a look what else we can do the fifth iteration we saw that the model behavior update of the hearts is quite expensive um, when we actually look at it the heart promo logic update function itself even though it takes up nearly no milliseconds individually, because we have a thousand of them, it nearly goes to one milliseconds of time being taken up by that function. And as we already know how to use jobs, and we know that the update logic basically doesn't depend on other hard, so it's very isolated, we can run that multi-threaded with an iJob4 interface. Um, so we basically do the computation of where how the hard should look like on on the thread and distribute over multiple um, to further speed up the performance. And let me go into the implementation for this. Again, for all the rest, all the other uh, improvements we did in the past, of course, we keep. The only thing we improve upon now is to have that hearts logic, instead of being done on each heart individually, the hearts manager actually takes care of all of the hearts and does it um, for all of them and we basically have uh, need a new structure which is called the hearts promo logic transform value which has a position and the rotation and with that we have a new job which we can find here these are all the same jobs as before the swapping the sorting the calling and then we have the hearts promo logic job this is again an iJob4, which basically goes through an, through an array of data points and then extracts it. And here we just do exactly the same as we had in the Hearts Promo Logic um, update function. It's basically just this taken into here and doing exactly the same. Now, that is basically the only thing we do in addition to all the other optimizations we did in the past. And let's have a look of what that actually um, benefits us with, or if it actually stays exactly the same as before. So what did we discover in the results? Um, we are still more or less at the same performance. We just moved that one milliseconds now for the parts from a logic job from those roughly one milliseconds from before, we actually managed to reduce it to 0 0.33 milliseconds. Um, but writing to the actual transforms is still quite expensive, but at least we already reduced those transform logics from doing it in the update by doing it in a job by a factor of three, which is already quite good. Now let's push it even one step further. The bottleneck is now actually primarily the updating of those transforms 
um, with that logic. And Unity actually has implemented a new way of modifying transform values uh, with a so-called transform access array. Um, and when we go to the last version, uh, which we take a look at today, the last iteration, we can see in version six, we, we have one new implementation. Of course, all of those are burst compiled. Um, we have a method called parallel 4 transform And that allows us to actually have a transform access array, which allows us to modify directly the value of model behavior transforms inside the job when it's burst compiled, which means we can speed it up heavily. So we have here exactly the same code as we had before the oscillation, but now we can directly modify the local position and rotation of a transform with the transform access array. And to actually do that, we have to do nearly nothing. We just have to create the transform access array here, which we call trial transforms. Um, and then we can go here, we just add the actual transform, which is the child transform from those hearts, uh, the part which actually rotates, which before had the hard promo logic on it. Um, we still leave it there, but we disable it so it doesn't do the computation twice. We add that hard promo logic transform to the child transforms. And then when we have that in the update method, we can just simply schedule them after the whole uh, logic has been done and we have identified which hearts actually need to be updated, uh, we can here then run this hard promo logics job where we pass in the child transforms of those hard transforms. Um, and this job doesn't depend on anything because we know all the jobs have been completed beforehand. And we actually can see afterwards in the profiler how well this actually worked. And we first let it quickly compile that we can see what is the, in the last iteration, what is actually the performance of, of the game after we added the 100,000 hearts to it and how well it actually works. So we can see here we are, even with the profile running, we are not, we are very close to the 60 frames. Sometimes it goes down and especially because I do the screen recording now, we are here at an average of around 45 frames. Without the recording, we easily manage to get around 60 frames a second, even though we run the hearts job, um, the calling job, the, the sorting job of those, those number of hearts in the game. And we can see the hearts are clearly visible everywhere. And of course we could push it a lot higher if we wanted to, if we had a lower target of maybe only 30 frames. But for the moment, we leave it at that. And we actually can see that we are averaging around 55 to, you know, definitely above 30 frames a second. We managed to, through that transform access, we actually managed to reduce that hard logic even further to 0 0.06 milliseconds from the 0 0.3 milliseconds. I mean, it's already very little time which it takes, but any further improvement is, is still incredible. And through the transform access area, we actually managed to reduce that by a, a multitude. Not exactly a 10x reduction in time, but uh, very close to that. So now to the conclusion. I know there was a lot of information. I don't expect any of you to be able, if you have never heard of DOTS or the job system or any of that, to implement all of those methods um, right after hearing this talk. That was not the goal. The goal is that you can see that even if you lose mono, if you use mono behaviors now and you only want to use the production ready parts of the DOTS technology stack, you can still use it in your current game to actually achieve incredible performance. So. It also, with the transform access array, we saw that Unity has a tight integration between the job system and the transform access arrays that you can actually use it for motor behaviors as well and not just in the ECS land. The hard logic, which was uh, evidently very simply implemented in the beginning, where we just spawned a lot of hearts in the whole volume, was completely impossible to run. I mean, we went from basically three frames a second to up to close to 55 frames a second. So it's evident that the dot stack can give you incredible performance uh, while you can do engine level performance implementations of sorting and custom functions. And you can actually use the burst compiler to do something which was completely impossible before. I hope that small little overview helped you to get at least excited and maybe learn more about the dot stack. And we hope you have a few questions and we cannot wait to answer them. Thank you. Okay, I hope that was at least to some point understandable for many of you. It's definitely difficult to wrap your head around um, 
what are blendable types, like how to implement the job functions, etc. And also there were some algorithms which are not easy to grasp if you've never heard of Quicksort and they don't know how to get an early out. But we will make the repository available for you to um, you know, investigate uh, later on after this webinar. Um, we will share it afterwards with the links. It will be on GitHub and you can then browse through the code. And um, when you join our uh, the XR Bootcamp Discord, you can also ask questions there if certain things are still not clear. But we have an additional section prepared. Brian will talk about the ECS part, which is actually highly exciting, especially because job dependencies become a little bit complicated if you start to modify things and need to think about it. And the ECS makes a lot of things a lot simpler, especially pooling of game objects is not anymore needed as you can spawn thousands of them in one frame and it doesn't cost much. So it's a highly exciting technology stack, especially also Unity Physics, which is a stateless physics engine. There's so many cool things coming down the pipeline, but I wanna take, don't wanna take anything away. So Brian, please go ahead with the ECS part. Okay, thanks very much. Um, let's see, so it looks like, I mean, if in terms of official clock time, we have like five minutes, but I, I think we can go beyond and it's not an issue, right? And, and we can do the Q&A after I speak for maybe 10 minutes or so. Definitely, um, I think. definitely. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, I, I do want to note though about um, Roger's example project. I, I should note, like, you should understand, like, the only way to truly accurately measure performance is to not do it in the editor and not while you're recording either. That that is going to mess with your your results. So you saw like some inconsistencies in some of what he showed there. So that that's an important point. Um, also, I will note. Actually, I believe I wonder if you looked at collections, Roger. There is there should be a sort provided for you in the form of a job that is already you probably didn't have to implement your own sort, I would guess. I wonder if you looked at that. Um, and also one more comment on that is that I th just looking at my, my, my first guess is you probably could solve that problem uh, most effectively by spatially partitioning the hearts, like break your world up into a bunch of grid cells. I, I'm sure you considered this, but for educational purposes, I understand why you did what you did, but but like the, probably, pro the way you probably solved that particular problem in reality is you, you wanna like break things up into a bunch of separate lists bucketed by grid cell, and then you wouldn't need yeah, that brought, that probably would solve most of the performance problem in that particular case, but 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 otherwise it was, it was nice to see that the, the, the like progression of here's here's a single threaded job now parallel and bursted that that was cool. Um, I, I will I also last thing you just said is you said entities allows you to create a bunch of game objects and not worry about pooling. That's that's not accurate. You instead of game objects you create entities and those you don't really typically have to worry about pooling. In fact, I can't think of a case where you would honestly. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about entities. Sorry for correcting you so much. Um, so uh, the performance problems we're trying to solve with the entities package is that uh, you want as much as possible your data access to be cache friendly to the CPU and you want the code itself to be cache friendly. What does this mean? So, sorry, I'll try and slow down a bit. So uh, in a modern processor, uh, in a modern system, the CPU tends to be way, way faster than the system RAM. It's orders of magnitude faster and so, Anytime the CPU has to actually read and write memory, um, it's going to sit and stall. It's going to wait. So that's why we have a cache sitting in between. And so anytime you access an address of memory, instead what happens is it gets pulled, it gets copied from main system RAM into cache, and then CPU then reads it from the cache. And the next time the CPU then has to read that same address, if it's already sitting, if it's still sitting in the cache, then great, the CPU doesn't have to wait for the CPU. So these units of memory called cache lines, which are 64 bytes on most platforms now, they when you access a single byte, you're actually grabbing that whole cache line and it's getting copied into cache. So you access that byte again or, or any of those other 64 bytes, it's probably still sitting in the cache the next time. So ideally, when you access data, as much as possible, you want the CPU, all the data it needs to already be sitting in the cache. Now, obviously that's not always possible, but the question is how can we try and bias things, you know, arrange things. So that's usually the case, at least for our most important workloads. And uh, very, very helpfully, there's a feature of, of what memory systems will do where uh, called prefetching, where if you access a, a certain byte of memory and the CPU go, then goes to the next byte, the next byte, the next byte, if you start reading through memory sequentially, the prefetching logic of the memory system will kick in and say, aha, I'm, I'm going to guess that you probably need the next cache line after this one. So I'm not just going to grab I'm going to go ahead and grab that while you're still working with this cache line. And probably by the time you get there, it'll probably be sitting in cache already for you. So it's very much like uh, laying the train tracks right, right down before the train gets there. That, that's what you want with prefetching. And, and so then if you go process some big array, if you go loop through, through some array of bytes, 
Um, what you'll get a cache miss probably for that first byte. It's probably if it's not sitting in cache, you're gonna the CPU will stall waiting to bring that into that cache line into memory. But then all the other cache lines of that array, thanks to prefetching, you, the CPU usually doesn't have to wait in most cases. So as much as possible, we want to try and arrange our, our, our key data, the things that we need to process uh, at scale. We want to put them in some big, nice contiguous arrays. That is what we're trying to aim for. Uh, and then the story with code uh, caching is that, well, you know, let me go back again so that doesn't distract me. Oops, oh, oops too much. Um, the issue with code is that, you know, code itself has to be loaded from memory uh, into cache before the CPU can execute those instructions. And so ideally, um, when code executes, all of the instructions are already sitting in cache most of the time. So an anti-pattern, what you don't want to have happen is say you have a thousand monster objects and they all have an update that needs to be run. And what you would want is for in a single frame that update method for that monster to be loaded once for that frame. And then you loop through all the monster data and run the update on each one of those monsters. That is a sensible, obvious thing to do. But if you update one monster and then go do something else, run some other code and then update another monster, go off to something else and then update the next monster. If you like interleave the updates of your monsters with other stuff, well, that other code itself has to be copied from memory into cache and it might overwrite the the monster update code in the cache, it'll, it'll temporarily overwrite it. So the next time you update a monster in the same frame, it has to load it again. So like in the worst case scenario, if you update a thousand monsters, you might end up reloading that one um, uh, up monster update method code a thousand times, which is obviously very stupid. We don't want to do that, right? And, and you might think, well, surely Unity in, with mod behaviors doesn't do that. If I have a bunch of a thousand monsters of all the same type, it can surely like, group them together, their updates, you would think um, for good reasons, it doesn't actually do that. So you do get this, this the bad the bad case, the, ba the anti-pattern in the context of model behaviors. So that is one thing that entities needs to fix. So the entities package itself. So the performance problem we're trying to solve is cache-friendly data and code. And what entities is, is an implementation of an architectural pattern that is known as ECS, standing for entities, components, and systems. Be very clear, it is not a system of entity components, it's a thing with entities, components, and systems. That's the, that's the proper way to read it, really. So the entities and the components are the data size of things, and I don't have the time to go into details in this talk of precisely how things are laid out, but the gist of it is we want that component data and those entities to be laid out in nice big arrays. For So for most of our purposes, most of the critical parts of our code, we can just loop through them in nice big uh, linear fashion and get the benefits of prefetching for the most part and avoid a lot of CPU stalls, avoid a lot of the CPU having to sit and wait for data access in, in many, many cases. Um, and then on the code side, that's the systems. Systems are, you know, kind of skip ahead. Systems are extremely simple, really. They're just a thing that has, it's, it's a type you define with an update method, basically. And that update method will run once in the frame, just once always. Um, and it kind of handily also compared to mono behavior updates, these system updates, when you care, you can actually specify, oh yeah, I want this system to run before this other one in the frame. So that's kind of handy. You know, you can't really do that with, with model behavior updates. You can put things in pre-update and late update versus update, but that's, you know, not as, not as flexible. You don't have as much control there. So that's really all there's to say about systems, really. Um, so going back to the entities, entities are basically analogous to game objects, pretty much. They serve pretty much the same purpose. Um, but in terms of data, they're very different. Uh, a game object is, um, an actual managed object that is a container that contains some number of components. It has like a list of components that it has. Whereas an entity is just an ID number. It's just this tiny little int, basically. Or long int, yeah, excuse me. Um, so the components, meanwhile, are themselves unmanaged objects in most cases. They're struct values. Um, and they, again, I can't go into details here, but they end up arrayed uh, in, in, in nice big arrays. So. If you have a bunch of foo components and bar components, your, your foos will, for the most part, be in, in a, a bunch of nice big arrays, and all your bar components will be in a different set of arrays. And so when it comes time to access, hey, I want to loop over uh, all the entities which have a foo and a bar component. I want to um, process each one individually. I want to visit each foo and bar of each entity one by one. Um, you can do that with nice big linear array access. Um, Th that is the gist of what we're shooting for. That's what everything is optimized for in entities is that particular case. Now to be clear, in some kinds of code, you know, you just naturally do have to skip around memory. You have to jump around and visit this entity, which links to this other entity. That some use cases, that's just necessary. But the idea is we're, we're optimizing for like the important cases, the big cases where we need scale. And that's in those cases, 
you can usually go through the, these components in, in nice sequential order. Uh, and very importantly, um, you can access these entities and the component data in jobs. So uh, it's all in managed data for the most part. And, and so that can be used in jobs. And so you can, you know, jobify that, that code that processes your, your components and first compile it. So you get all the benefits of all the things that Roger was just, just talking about right now. So uh, I do strongly encourage you, if you are interested in, in looking at entities right now, um, I strongly encourage you to, the, the, maybe I'll go find some links that I can post later, um, but there, there are already a lot of talks to talk about more detail about precisely how the data is laid out in, in these things called chunks. It's not really complicated. I, oh, sorry, there's my cat. Um, it's not really complicated, but it really helps to understand that data structure. Uh, one second. Um, so I'm gonna have to eject my cat from the room in a minute. So um, the question then is, okay, you're gonna make your game out of entities instead of game objects perhaps, or, or possibly have them live side by side, but you want to be able to construct a scene of game objects, uh, sorry, a, a scene of entities, right? And have them loaded as a scene. You would think then that in the editor, you would have a kind of scene where you can just directly say this, this scene has this entity, this entity, that entity. But actually for a number of reasons that are kind of complicated, um, we instead have you create a scene out of ordinary game objects and give it components. I'll get. I'll move in a second. Um, and the idea is that at build time, we want to convert that list of game objects and their components into a set of entities that can then be serialized into um, into a file, and then that is what is loaded when the scene runs. I'll be right back. Sorry. Uh, maybe we take one of the questions. Um, Uncle Brian has uh, handled his um, little kitty. Um, so we have one question was, um, if you have studied computer science and you have maybe lived a few years inside Unity, um, if you basically need to unlearn everything you know and start again from scratch because dots and data are into programming is so much different from what you're used to. Um, maybe Brian, as you're back, can you maybe help sure. answer that one if you think um, it's useless now and everything is new and fresh? Well, when we do our internal dots training, we train up our own people on using dots. Part of it is emphasizing data oriented design principles, which dots is sort of uh, structured around, hence the name. Um, in some sense, yeah, you, you are relearning habits, but I can say particularly with the non entities parts of dots, um, jobs and burst mainly, you can, I would recommend you can find selective use cases for them where, yeah, you, know, you have to get familiar with the API, but that, that's probably the best entry point to dots because when you do use entities, you're, you're going to want to be using that stuff as well. So it, it, I think it, that, that is probably a good entry point at this point for, for, for getting burst and dots is trying to find some opportunity of, I have this one particular hard computation problem in the context of my normal Unity game. Let, let, let's maybe try and experiment with using uh, jobs and burst for that part. And then maybe we should come back to this. I, I bet Fabrice has some thoughts, so. Yeah, um, I think overall, uh, if you ever, I think your experience in computer science probably has, will help you understand how amazing the job system is. Because if you ever have to implement something by hand with logs oh, right. and, and semaphores and all of that, and know how hard it is to get that right and actually working properly in all circumstances, I think your computer science background will probably help you appreciate of how much easier it is with all the tools offered by Unity. Um, but I don't think it's useless that you have learned about databases. ECS is very similar to a database. So I think you can benefit a lot from your previous experience. It's just, you might need to unlearn certain things or be a little bit questioning more what you did in the past and maybe be open for new ideas. Yeah, with entities in particular, if you're going to make a game that's all in entities, um, that is a head spin in many ways and it takes some adjustment. Once you get used to it, I think in many ways it pays off and is simpler in the end. Like yeah. a lot of bad patterns. I have a, a video on YouTube called Object Oriented Programming is Bad, where I make an argument about how object programming leads you astray in, in all sorts of ways. And, and kind of, it's very easy to create messes where I, I have found in particular, you know, once you get past the entry point, the learning curve, you end up creating code that's a lot simpler ultimately and easier to reason about, not just for performance's sake. It's a, it's a hard abstract argument to make about how is it actually easier to write cold ult code ultimately with DOD in this way. I think it is, it's a long argument that probably don't have time for here, but I, I, I certainly think that's the case, certainly in the long run. 
there's kind of a trajectory in a project where in the early phases it might seem easy to work with what you're familiar with but then very quickly towards that after you know a few months of development it's like oh i've already created a mess and, and i think dod and dots and with ecs it, once you get familiar with it it can it can really uh, avoid a lot of those those kinds of anti-patterns i'm sorry so um should i pick up here yeah let, let's continue with the presentation via answer more questions i'm almost done yeah i'm almost done here so um yeah so so the, the, we call this build time you know the, the conversion workflow you may have heard it as but this is the idea is that you'll, you'll construct your scenes in so-called authoring data which are game objects that won't then in most cases exist at runtime you want to have your runtime data be efficient entities and the game objects are there just for authoring purposes for like putting together a scene and describing the initial state of how things are supposed to be um yeah usually it ends up that uh one game object will correspond to one entity one generated entity and then the components on that game object usually one of them corresponds to at least one component that's put on that entity that is, that is usually the way it works out okay so so, so the remaining packages of hybrid rendering physics, uh, audio net code, I don't really have too much time to say, too, too much to say about these. Uh, admittedly, they'll go ahead and ask questions. Um, but the general idea is that, okay, if you're going to be creating a game around entities instead of game objects, then you want to have, you know, standard game engine functionality like rendering and, and audio and physics and so forth. So that's what these provide. And they have the benefit of not only allowing you to do those things with entities, but they themselves are implemented in terms of, of entities and the other DOS packages. So they have the benefit, the performance benefits of those. Um, and to varying degrees, that can actually itself in itself lead to significant performance gains is, you know, parts of Unity in effect, or um, the, the game engine you rely on is, is being rewritten in this fashion. So the hybrid render, um, I won't say much about it other than it's, do be clear, it's called the hybrid rendering uh, package, because not, not just the rendering package, because it itself is not actually a render. What it does is it takes your entity data that'll have components saying like translation, rotation, and scale, and, uh, and have a little component called render mesh on it, it'll take those and convert it into a form that can be passed on to the scriptable rendering pipeline, the, the, the normal Unity SRP, HDRP or URP, and do the, that does the actual rendering. Hybrid is basically just kind of transforming data. It also does the culling part and it does LOD, but um, uh, that, that's the gist of it. And they've, they've made great strides in the past year. It's come quite a long way in terms of like getting closer to feature parity with HDRP and URP. Um, to do a lot of performance improvements. Uh, yeah, so it's make, making good progress. Uh, so most of what I can say about it. Um, animation package, I admittedly, I know very little about animation in general, including this package. Um, it's like, I honestly probably can't answer many questions about it. Um, it's maybe one of the le lesser, I don't even know if there's a public version available yet. I honestly don't know. I'd have to go look. <laughs> um, yeah, like physics animation, package, there, sir? Animation, there is a package available. There are a few examples, but it's very, um, rough like it's you have to actually write code with connect yeah. they don't yet really have an api that's meant to be convenient to use it's like low level kind of inconvenient yeah. because they're focusing on features and everything and implementation and they just haven't gone to that part yet i think is, yeah, is the, the gist of it yeah. um no visual editor yet and all this stuff but you can yeah. see what they're working towards in the examples they also have really nice example projects where you can see what they're currently working on yeah yeah i know they're working on like tooling aspects as well related to animation for yeah um the physics package uh one of the more mature packages i think um you know maybe there's some features left i know i think they're working like some additional motors and joints and things but it's you know probably some performance problems and, and such but uh it, it's relatively mature at least compared to animation i suppose um and the interesting thing about it is that there's two back ends so in a physics engine there's the solver part that does all the the math and, and the physics simulation and with the physics package you can write code to the API of this package and either use the, the Unity physics backend as it's called, or the Havoc backend, a, a backend that's been written for us by Havoc. And the, the main difference between these two things is that the Unity one is stateless. It doesn't do any kind of caching from frame to frame. It doesn't carry over any state information. And the advantage of that is mainly for network games. In network games that can lead to, if you have state that has to be carried around, that can lead to cases where it has to be transmitted over the network, You know, putting a lot of burden on bandwidth and th that often is not really an option at all. So you'd probably lean towards, to my understanding, you, I'm not an expert on this. I, I think you would lean towards the stateless option, the, the Unity physics option for network game. Whereas the Havoc uh, backend, the, the main thing it does different is it does caching. And what that caching is, it's information about like guesses about how much error there was in the prior frame. And you carry that over and you can factor it into the, the physics calculation and thereby get more accurate results. And that, that, that degree of accuracy is going to the practical effect 
is that uh, pr the primary use case is you want to stack a bunch of objects and not have them start jittering and fly apart. So you want stable stacking for like large stacks of things. That is the main use case to my understanding. Um, it's debatable how many games really need that perhaps, but uh, that, that, that is what you would reach for. That's one reason to reach for the Havoc backend instead. Um, I, I guess if you want to make a network game that needs both, that also needs stable stacking, I, I don't know if you have an option there, but uh, oh, that, that is my question. They, they did quite yeah. improve the stacking. Um, and they also oh, yeah. Talk on that of how they did stateless stacking. And of course, it's a compromise. It's not as good as Havoc, evidently. Yes. Yeah, yeah you, you're right. There's a, it, I'm sorry, you're am I cutting you off? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there, there was a Microsoft uh, game stack event where um, the, the primary person on, on, on our Havoc backend uh, from Havoc. Uh, sorry, I'm forgetting his name. Steve, something. Uh, he uh, gave a really interesting talk talking about how, okay, in a stateless implementation, there's some tricks where you can get closer to the, you know, to, to have greater accuracy. And it was pretty cool. I, I said, search for game stack Unity physics, I think. Microsoft Unity game stack. Yeah, interesting video. Um, media package, like animation, I know almost nothing about it. Um, so I almost can't even really say anything about it. If you have questions, go ahead and ask. And then lastly, Netcode, Fabrice and I actually do know quite a bit about this because we just put together an internal training session to, to train our people on, hey, you need to understand Netcode. It's a really confusing topic, Netcode itself, not this package per, per se. Um, the gist of it here is that, well, in Netcode in general, there's, there's two main models of how to do Netcode. There's a authoritative server-based version where you have the clients do prediction and then there's a version of, of a model of netcode where you don't have any authoritative server. It's just all peer to peer. But the, the game, the hard part is your game logic has to be deterministic, which can be hard to do. And you might want to do rollback, which is what fighting games do. So that, that peer to peer model, most games use an authoritative server, but then games with fewer player count, the small player counts like fighting games and RTSs, those are the primary cases. Uh, they often uh, typically will use peer to peer. And right now, what we call the netcode package is just authoritative server. The, the plan is there will be a, a separate package at some point that will be peer-to-peer, -peer, but for right now it's authoritative server, which is what most people want. And I mean, you could do a fighting game in RTS with authoritative server, usually in practice, you wanna, the, the reason you wanna do peer-to-peer -peer mainly is because to save on bandwidth, that's the main, you don't wanna have to pay for, excuse me, you wanna don't pay for hosting time for that, that doesn't make concern. CPU time on, on, a, on a web server somewhere, web server, on, a, on a data uh, farm somewhere. Okay, so, as I mentioned at the top, like I really can't, uh, I don't want to say anything that even hints at like timelines for when entities and these other packages are going to come out of preview. Not my, not my liberty to say that, even if I could tell you. Um, but I can sort of give you a sense of like where things stand. That you could piece this all together if you just go on the forums and these things have been talked about. So nothing of this is like really new. But in general, I would say like yeah, just definitely the usability, performance, and feature completeness of entities itself and these packages. You know, to one degree or another, that definitely uh, needs to improve in various areas. Better documentation samples. That's recent. Our, our and myself. That's our department. Um, you haven't seen us produce anything yet. You, you probably might see us release some public stuff. Probably you know this year. Can't promise anything, but you'll probably see some stuff from us not too too far in the future. Uh, and then the rest of these bullet points, I, I don't want to go through them one by one. But if you have questions, you know, go ahead and take a screenshot. And, and if you have if you're interested in what I mean by any of these bullet points, go ahead and ask. But uh, this is me throwing you a bone of like trying to give a little hint of like where things stand. And yeah, there are definitely things that are being worked on and improved. Um, I can't say anything about timeline, but like do understand uh, people people speculate, oh, DOS must be dead because you know we don't necessarily haven't been messaging much about it of late for various reasons. Um, but it, the more people are working on it than ever, so like it's 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 not dead by any means. I can at least say that. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, definitely I mean, as we emphasize the the four packages that are preview, you know, that's all blessed to use right now, and then entities. People are asking, should you even adopt it now? It really depends on you, I think is the real answer. It depends on, do you want, are you willing to live with something that there's in its current form uh, with no guarantees? Look, uh, it's a hard question, um, but it's kind of above my pay grade to, to, to answer. Um, it, it is probably, it is also to be clear, like it's gonna be the most invasive thing to adopt. Like if you want to like really embrace entities, it's gonna, your old project probably is gonna wanna revolve around it um, in a way that with just jobs and bursts, that's not the case. You can use that selectively in the context of a larger project. And so that, again, that's probably the, the more effective place to start. And I have no idea how long you talked. Much longer than I expected. <laughs> that was 20 minutes again, wasn't it? Okay, so um, thank you. And I...